On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, are modern day Q ships possible? I am your host, Sam McCogliano. Welcome to today's episode. So there is an image floating around on Twitter, and it makes its rounds every now and then, of a container ship that is fitted with these boxes that open up and out pops missiles. And they have an attack in an enclosed harbor. And I want to talk about that because there are some people on the internet and YouTube who talk about this quite a lot. And there are some things they get right and there's some things they get wrong. So I thought I'd take a moment here and talk about what is the feasibility of such a system being outfitted on a vessel. It seems like a, a, a good option here. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, this is the video or the image, I should say, that was floating around. And so here you see a container ship and then up on the container ship opens these different units here. You'll see some of the containers will uh, basically uh, elevate up and out comes a whole variety of different missiles. You see some going into a 90 degree launch mode. You see some control units right here. And then you see a sampling of different Chinese style missiles going out. And I'm gonna show this slide again in a minute with translation superimposed on it. But that's the image you see. And this is not a new idea at all. Matter of fact, the title of this video is Q Ships. And you can go back to the age of sail and see where merchant men and, and merchant ships were converted into warships. One of the most famous warships in the U.S. Navy, the Bonham Richard, was a converted uh, East India uh, freighter. The first vessels of the U.S. Navy were converted commercial vessels. But Q ships are a little different because Q ships operate under this idea of basically a disguise. And it really gets its name from the place they operated from, and that was Queenstown, Ireland. This is during the First World War. Queenstown is now known as Cove. But Queenstown would dispatch these vessels, Q ships, hence the, the, the term. And what these vessels were, they were meant to look like normal merchant ships, but they were heavily armed. And what they would do is disguise the weaponry on board. The goal here was to basically flush out a German submarine. German submarines in World War I were more effective than they were in World War II. Uh, and German submarines torpedoes were terrible in World War I, absolutely horrible. And so one of the things that German submarines would do was actually use either gunfire or actually board vessels and have the crews abandon ship, set charges, open up the seacocks and scuttle the vessels. And the goal here was to disguise merchant ships give them huge armament so that when the U-boats surface and they start sending over their crews in these little inflatable boats, they would drop the uh, side ports and open fire and sink submarines. They were actually a little bit effective initially. The problem is the British begin to arm all their vessels. Even in World War I, the U.S. follows that with a ship called the Santee. Uh, the U.S. operated one Q ship. This is her. Uh, she went out on one mission, got torpedoed on the first mission, and then was repaired and given back to the uh, British. And Q ships have been used throughout history. We've seen types of vessels like this, where you take a commercial vessel and outfit it. In World War II, I would argue where you saw commercial vessels outfitted as warships was really in the conversion of uh, merchant ships, freighters and tankers, into escort carriers where you put flight decks on them and used them. Now, they were taken over by the Navy and they were brought within the U.S. Navy to use. On commercial vessels, you would have armed guard detachments but they would still maintain their civilian crew. So this image is a really important one. Let me pull it up here. So here's the image with some translations uh, superimposed on it. So right here, containerized face-to-face -face strike integrated combat system. Now I'm gonna say right off the bat, I Google translated this. I am not fluent in Mandarin. So this is what I, I pulled up. But the missions here were really interesting. Attacking the enemy fleet, attacking enemy convoys, attacking enemy ports. And so a couple of things I wanna get out of your mind off the bat. Number one, the concept that you load these units on a ship and the ship doesn't know about it is highly unlikely for a variety of different reasons. Number one, these containers are heavy. They're heavy because of the weapon system on board. And the only way these systems work is if they're on the very top stack of the containers pile. There is no, it is up to a myriad of systems that determine where containers go, but heavy containers go toward the bottom. They are not, you put the lightest containers on top. 
And not only are the lightest containers on top, but these missile, these systems, because of the configuration here, particularly this 90 degree system and where these things uh, uh, turn, you would have to make sure you got these containers facing the right way. Plus, these container systems would require power sources for them. Now, they may have batteries that allow them to run for a set period of time, but you would eventually need a power source. And there are finite numbers of plugs on board to plug units uh, on a container ship. And if you're plugging units, you're not stacking them up high. I can tell you that much right now. And so it is highly unlikely that a container ship would not know about these units going on board now let's be clear too there are there's there's lying about containers there's we most people on container ships don't know what's in all the containers however when it comes to weights and issues like this very unlikely plus you would have to have a lot of coordination to ensure that the containers are right where you want them on deck facing the right way on the very top this involves cargo stevedores longshore you name it a variety of different elements to it. The other element is that these are shipped on board container ships into ports and then brought around the country and, and, and you know, with a push of a button, they'll pop up and start firing. Well, you, same issues apply here. Number one, power. They need power to work, either batteries or a generator or plugged in. And if that's not happening, they're, they're not going to be able to be used. Second, this is going to have to get through the CBP, the Customs and Border Protection screening process. And as much as we joke about the fact that CBP doesn't really get a chance to do a lot, they actually do. And one of the things that is, is screening containers. They go through screening. Even though a very small percentage of containers are ever open in the United States, maybe 2 to 3% tops, you go through screening materials where you can basically see what's inside the containers. And if containers don't match up to what's supposed to be inside them, if they manifest this thing to be carrying barrels of, of oil or, or pallets of, of, of food, and that's not what they're seeing in the screening, that's going to flag them. Plus, where do these containers come from? That's the other element that would be tracked. I'm not saying it's impossible. Let's be clear. I mean, things are smuggled into this country all the time, but a very low probability that that happens, which really brings up the third probability, that ships are specifically outfitted by nations to mount these vessels. And that, let me be clear, is a potential. That is the one potential I would argue that you could see where a nation, Russia, China, Iran, the United States, whoever, decides to take a container ship and on the top deck outfit it with the style of vessels basically turning it into a Q ship, into a missile ship of some kind. The problem with that scenario is this is container ships just don't show up off ports. They follow set routes. Even though there are thousands of container ships out there, they follow set routes, set patterns. They are squawking on AIS, the automated information system. And to have a ship just arrive at a port without any kind of knowledge or for, you know, uh, uh, precursor is very unusual. Now, I'm not saying it can happen. Again, it can happen. And again, you could see that happen. Uh, we could see this vessel spoof another vessel that's supposed to be arriving there. That happens a lot. We've seen a lot of spoofing going on in the Black Sea and the Baltic during the Russian-Ukraine war. So you can do that. And the potential does exist that you could have a vessel that all of a sudden arrives and, and unleashes a series of missiles. It could strike ships at anchor. It could just strike an enemy fleet. What if you bring a container ship into the port of Norfolk, for example, that has these weapons on board? Can they hit the Atlantic fleet sitting there? Potential can exist for that to happen. I will also mention that this vessel that is equipped with these missiles would have very little defensive armament at all on board and not be able to resist a lot of damage, uh, which would make this basically a suicide mission for the crew on board. But it does exist. And this has been looked at a variety of times. Back in the 1980s, the U.S. Navy developed the idea of the Arapaho concept, where they can convert container ships into this. The British did it with the Atlantic Conveyor, outfitting that vessel to launch Harriers and, and uh, heavy lift helicopters during the Falklands War. And we've seen this concept done before. One of the issues has been, for example, for the United States, is it doesn't have a lot of unused container ships sitting around. 
Uh, there are going to be a lot of container ships sitting around with the new builds that are going on right now. And so the potential there for tracking them. And this is one of the reasons why it's really important for nations, for coast guards, for ports to track entry and, and exit of vessels in and out of their ports. I would hope that U.S. defense systems and, and organizations are tracking worldwide ships coming in. I would hope Singapore would have a system in place to track the arrival of vessels in and out. The problem is it has a lot of vessels transiting just outside its port, which could bring this type of weapon system to bear. So this is not as science fiction as some people make it sound. At the same time, it's not like you're going to be steaming on a container ship and all of a sudden the containers pop open and start flinging missiles and you didn't know about it. That's unlikely to happen. But this is a system that needs to go. This is irregular warfare. This is asymmetric. This is the type of things that we see that could potentially happen. I would add another one to this, which isn't in this vid in this image right here, but fishing vessels, which could carry uh, underwater and surface drones, and even torpedoes or mines are all dangerous type weapons. And you can see the, the kind of precursor for this. Remember, the U.S. got struck by an asymmetric attack to start the war in the Pacific. It wasn't just the fact that the Japanese launched an aircraft carrier strike to them. They used weapons that we had no idea about, uh, long lance torpedoes that were modified to operate in shallow depth. They had high altitude bombs, modified 16 inch shells that were dropped, and they used two person submarines to attack, plus they attacked at a distance that nobody thought anybody could deploy a fleet over nearly 4,000 miles. When the US was talking about that, we could only range a fleet 2,500 miles. And the Japanese didn't just attack Pearl Harbor, they attacked all across the Pacific, including the west coast of the United States. And so asymmetric style of warfare is something to be worried about. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a big thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Well, you can contribute directly to the page by hitting the super thanks button down below or heading on over to Patreon. You'll see a uh, image pop up here of uh, Patreon. You can click on that or down in the show notes and you can become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off.